today we are resuming once again in the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, you remember we started this series last, uh, beginning of last summer, and uh, we're going to continue once again now uh, in this book. And uh, who knows how long we're going to go, uh, but we're in chapter 12 today. So if you have your Bibles, you want to take them out. You can turn to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, there will be the words on the screen, and those of you that are watching on live stream, you'll see the words uh, posted as well. But I'm going to read uh, this uh, verses 1 through 12, but today we are beginning a mini-series on spiritual gifts. Uh, we're going to be focusing on this important subject. Uh, I don't know how long we're going to go, at least probably through January. Uh, I, this is one of the main reasons why I felt the Lord wanted us to preach and teach on 1 uh, Corinthians to talk through these spiritual gifts. And I'm excited for this mini-series, and uh, I'm trusting the Lord will do good things. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Let's pray as we seek the Lord during this time together. Lord, we worship you today. We thank you, God, that you are holy and that you are on your throne. And we thank you, God, that you came to our rescue. And we thank you, God, that you sent us Jesus. And so today, Jesus, would you be praised and would you be honored and lifted high I pray that you would guide us by the Holy Spirit, that we would be led of you, and Lord, that we would be equipped of you to do everything you've called us to do and to be. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this subject of spiritual gifts is a very important subject. Uh, we could easily take months to cover uh, this topic. As I mentioned, I don't know how long we're going to go. We're going to just let the Lord lead us during this time. But uh, I do want to limit the scope of our discussion to only the spiritual gifts that are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians. In fact, there's actually, if you look in Scripture, you can see about 26 different types of gifts. The Greek word for gifts is charisma. Charis is where we get the word grace. And so there's 26 that are mentioned in the New Testament. Many are directly referred to in the Scriptures. Others are inferred. You'll see here on the screen, those of you see, uh, watching online, you can see posted as well, 26 different uh, gifts. That list potentially could be expanded beyond these 26 if you looked at various places in the Old Testament. As I mentioned, we're not going to go every gift mentioned here. We're not going to go week to week and talk about every one of them. But during these next few weeks, I would like to take an in-depth look at the nine gifts of the Spirit that are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians. They are particularly word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So we have our work cut out for us uh, in the weeks ahead to discuss these important matters, but I believe that the Holy Spirit, and my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will guide this time. The reason why I want to focus specifically on these nine spiritual gifts alone rather than all of them is because I do want to stay within the scope of where we are in 1 Corinthians and stay here uh, in the text that
that we have. But also, another reason why I want to focus on these nine is because the nature of these nine gifts are less obvious than some of the others. For example, when we talk about mercy or teaching or an encouragement, uh, they are a bit more straightforward and don't require as an extensive explanation as some of these other in chapter 9. Now, I will say this, and this is a point I'm going to mention the weeks ahead. All the gifts are supernatural. They're all, they're all empowered by the Holy Spirit. But I find that these nine gifts here are, have some unique things about them that do require some explanation. And so the, these nine gifts also tend to be a little bit more controversial among some Christians, for better or worse. Uh, but I want to provide some clarity and some explanation as we go. But we're going to just trust that the Lord will guide this time. And I also believe that the church in general... And Clay House Church in particular desperately needs an infusion of the supernatural activity of God. Amen? That we need God's Spirit in our life and in our ministry. And this is where I believe God has called us to go and to be and to do and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I also want to be very clear at the outset that we are not worshiping the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are worshiping the Spirit of the gifts. Let me say that again. We are not worshiping the gifts of the Spirit, but rather the Spirit of the gifts. Our aim is that Jesus would be exalted and that we seek Jesus. And when we follow Him and His Spirit, with His work within our lives, the gifts will flow naturally as He wills. But we need to worship Jesus. So we're not worshiping gifts per se. We're worshiping Jesus and letting His gifts flow in us and through us. You know, last year I made it very clear that is our aim here at Clayhouse to be a spirit-led, spirit-fed, and spirit-formed church. And that is still true. Despite all that's gone on this past year and the bumps and the bruises of life and the things that we've experienced, I think more than ever, God wants us to be a spirit-led church. And you see all the troubles going on in our society and all the challenges, even constitutionally, that are going on in, country, in our country and things that are rising to the surface. It's especially now that we press into Jesus and that we as Christians would seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the deeper life of Christ Jesus. And so this is also our roots uh, within the Christian Missionary Alliance. You know, over a hundred years ago, uh, a minister was holding a healing meeting with about a th thousand people present. And the, the minister received a prophetic insight, otherwise known as a word of knowledge, that someone in the congregation was resisting the Lord. And a woman came forward and admitted that she was the one. She had been severely ill, but had resisted coming for prayer. And the minister anointed her with oil and laid his hands on her and prayed for her. And she fell to the floor and seemed to be unconscious for about a half an hour. And when she recovered consciousness, she got up and discovered that she was healed without pain for the very first time in 20 years. Who was this minister? A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And we could share many, many more stories and perhaps in the weeks ahead of the miraculous power of God at work among his people. You know, even before the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s, A.B. Simpson declared that the Christian and Missionary Alliance stands for an absolute faith in supernatural things and a supernatural God. You know, friends, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we serve a God who is capable and more than able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ever ask, think, or imagine. And one of the reasons why I joined the Christian Missionary Alliance uh, some 15, 16 years ago is because I wholeheartedly agree with A.B. Simpson that we want to be a people that is full of the Spirit of God. And that we have faith in the supernatural things of God. And you know, we need a biblical balance, don't we? We need a sense where we're staying true to Scripture, but staying true to the Spirit of God who works through Scripture, but works actively in our lives today. One of the things I want to charge us with here at Clayhouse, and I also want to charge the Christian Mission Alliance, is that we would stay true to our roots. First, that we would look back 
and celebrate and learn from our heritage, but secondly, advance forward with a fresh fire, with a fresh resolve to seek the fullness of the Spirit of God in our lives and to seek the Lord and to advance the gospel to all nations in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Clayhouse, God doesn't leave us empty-handed. He gives us himself. He gives us Jesus. And he also gives us his charisma, his grace gifts, spiritual gifts, in order to be able to accomplish his work and his ministry. You know, here as we read in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, just as we're resuming once again in this wonderful letter, the Apostle Paul is going to actually take this entire section, chapter 12 all the way down through chapter 14, to be able to deal with spiritual gifts in the worshiping assembly. Now, just to give us a little bit of a background here, what, what has been taking place in the congregation there in Corinth, evidently some of the Corinthians had placed an inordinate emphasis on showy displays of spirituality. And they were, in many ways, disrupting or dominating the church's meetings, and it wasn't edifying the congregation spiritually. And so Paul actually takes a significant portion of his letter to address this subject. This actually means that it was a very important matter to Paul that they worship God the right way. And he actually exercises a considerable amount of pastoral tact in dealing with this important topic, as I'm sure was a rather sensitive topic for many people. And frankly, the same is still true today. But Paul teaches at length here the difference between the activity of the Holy Spirit and other forms of inspiration, how to discern and what, is, what is truly of the Holy Spirit, and how to display practically in, in behavior how those spiritual gifts should operate in a God-honoring way. And so we as Christians today, just as they needed it then, need true discernment. Discernment is actually a spiritual gift. It's something we need. We need this gifting of the Holy Spirit to discern the things of God. But I will give us two warnings because I think there are two dangers whenever we approach this subject of spiritual gifts and movements of the Holy Spirit. There's two dangers. The first danger is saying something is of the Holy Spirit when it is not. And the second danger is saying something is not of the Holy Spirit when it is. I think those are two equally dangerous ways we can go. Let me say it again. Saying something is not of the Holy Spirit, or saying something is of the Holy Spirit when it isn't, and saying something is not of the Holy Spirit when it is. So we must be careful, and we must be discerning of the Holy Spirit to not operate out of the flesh, but operate it out of, out of the Holy Spirit who is at work in our midst. And we're going to talk at length in the weeks ahead. Many of you that have been uh, attending Clay House for a little while know that we did a series last spring on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you, if you're wanting to kind of learn more, or maybe you missed that series, to check it out. It is on our church website. I would encourage you to do that. And Lord willing, as we move ahead, we're going to be talking about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we need to not just know cognitively, but we need to experience in our daily lives. I want to read verses 1 through 3 once again. Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. In other words, Paul's saying, don't be ignorant about these things. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So Paul's saying, I, I don't want you Corinthians to be ignorant about the things of the Holy Spirit. And frankly, we would say this, the Lord would say this to, to us today, that we should not be ignorant in the things of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, these, these Corinthians had pagan backgrounds, and Paul's saying, you weren't ignorant about that lifestyle. You still continued in that lifestyle before you became a Christian, so you're very aware of what that old way was. But now I want you to be informed of how you should live and what it means to be led of the Holy Spirit. And so what Paul is doing, is he's trying to correct not only their thinking, 
but their behavior and how they're operating as a church community corporately. You know, years ago I was in youth ministry, and one of the things we did in uh, teens is teaching kids how to share their faith with people. And so we would actually go on the street and share faith with uh, the gospel with people. And so we'd do some training in that. But one of the times, I remember asking uh, some people the question, how many beers or brands of beers, ten, how many <laughs> brands of beers can you name? Can you name 10 of them? And I, when I asked the men this, they could rattle off. You know, people off the street, they could name 10 brands of beers like that. But when it came to asking them, can you name any of the Ten Commandments, it was like crickets. Uh, some could maybe name a few, like you shouldn't lie or steal, but it didn't flow out naturally by, as, as naming beers. Uh, but it was very clear to me and all of us that people could find it very easier to name beers and brands of beers as opposed to the Ten Commandments, that people are more informed in, in the old beer than they were in the things of God. And I'd say that in our culture today, we have a lot of ignorance when it comes to the scriptures around us. It used to be that you could quote a verse and a lot of people would, would know what you're talking about. In our culture, is, once again, it's crickets. People don't know what you're talking about. And Paul's saying just as you know, people were, are ignorant towards the things of God, and we see that in our culture today. I will also say that there are many within the church, dare I say even Christians, that are ignorant to the things of the Holy Spirit. Oh, we might know the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. We might know that He indwells us cognitively in the sense that we, we know that in our minds. But as far as having any sense of the indwelling fullness and being filled with the Holy Spirit... It's like we're a deer in the headlights. We, we're just uncertain of really what that means or even if we are filled. And Lord willing, we're going to get to that in a little bit later this year. But Paul's aim right here as he's addressing the Corinthians is for the church to discern the true inspired utterance of the Holy Spirit. And he mentions here, he says, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is, is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now what Paul is not saying is that a non-believer can't say Jesus is Lord. I think there's people that can literally say that. But that one cannot confess Jesus as Lord without the prompting of the Spirit of God in their hearts. No one can confess Jesus as Lord without the Holy Spirit doing his work. And so this is why Paul says we need to have true discernment. And I will say that any church or ministry or movement, so-called movement of the Holy Spirit, it, that, that really, really is the, the test of what, whether or not it's of God is the place it gives to Jesus Christ. It is the work of the Spirit of God to bear witness to the Lordship of of Jesus Christ. And so what this means practically is I would just encourage you and challenge you and warn you as a pastor to stay away from any church, ministry, or so-called spirit-led movement that doesn't keep Jesus central in everything. The Holy Spirit, he always points people to Jesus, not to any individual. He always points people to Jesus. And actually the possession of any gift is not a matter of individual merit but of the sheer grace of God. So there's no place for boasting or self-aggrandizement. And I would warn you once again, be discerning about the place a ministry or a church gives Jesus Christ. Again, we're not worshiping the gifts of the Spirit. We're worshiping the Spirit of the gifts, the Spirit of Jesus. That's a very practical warning I would give to you. Look in verses 4 through 6. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everything. I lost my place. Empowered in all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the, the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and another utterance of knowledge and so forth as he continues through this list. What Paul is saying right here is that there are a variety of spiritual gifts. Of course, you saw the list that we had posted there on the screen just a few moments ago. But Paul's focusing here in the church in Corinth by emphasizing their need for a wider variety 
of manifestations with the one spirit within the church. And I would echo that same concern here at Clayhouse, that we need as well a wider variety of the gifts of the Spirit within our midst, or at least the cultivation of the stirring of the gifts of the Spirit of Christ. And the idea that Paul is conveying here is one of diversity within unity. This is a key concept that is going to be conveyed here in this passage. Diversity within unity. Why is that important? Well, Paul makes it very clear because it is true of the very character of God himself. We think of God as a triune being. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. And Paul makes it very clear that there's the same Spirit. The same, he mentions here the same Lord, the same God. What he's saying is that just as God is three in one, there's diversity within unity, within God's nature, so that should also be expressed among his body. Diversity within unity, that we are all one in Christ Jesus, yet we all uniquely have a role to fulfill and fill in the body of Christ, and that we also have a place where we are to operate in the spiritual gift or gifts that God has given us. And so this concept of diversity within unity is important because it flows from the very nature of God himself. And when we speak of diversity, you know, we automatically think of racial racial diversity and we need that. Uh, my prayer is that God would continue to do that work here in our church that we would reach more and more people in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what Paul is talking about here in this passage when he brings up this subject of diversity is not so much racial, even though we need that. He's talking about spiritual gifts, that there be a diversity of gifts being used within the body of Christ. He mentions verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You could say verse 7 kind of forms a thesis statement for the Apostle Paul in this entire passage. These gifts are given for the common good. Now he he mentions, he uses this word manifestation. What manifestation literally means is an open revelation to the senses. That's what a manifestation is. It's an open revelation to the senses, either to the eyes or to the ears. And so the gifts of the Spirit are evidences that the invisible Holy Spirit dwells within the believer, and the Holy Spirit, he is known through his work. He is known through his activity. He is known through the spiritual gifts that are being operated within the body of Christ. And spiritual gifts are really God going public among his people. Spiritual gifts are really God going public among his people. And every believer in Jesus Christ should have a personal experience of God's power and presence in their lives. You know, I'm all for sound doctrine, and we must be about understanding the scriptures correctly and understanding doctrine and having it right, and that is vitally important. But I will say that it's not enough. We must know God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Certainly, we, these, these operate, you know, we need both. It's not an either or, it's a both and. We must be spiritually sound as far as doctrinally sound, but we must also be experientially rich, that we know Jesus and that we are, have intimate fellowship with him and that the Spirit of God, we can discern the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that in the days and weeks and months ahead. But we must have an encounter with the living God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul says earlier in this book, he says, And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, if we only put all of our energies into sound doctrine, and we must be about sound doctrine, but only are limited by the wisdom of human beings... And we do not have any experience of the power of God in our midst. I think there's going to be a great deficit in our spiritual life. People need to not only know that God is rational, they need to know He's real. And God is known as He manifests His presence among us. Paul says, to each is given. This means what Paul is saying is that every true believer in Christ Jesus has at least one spiritual gift. 
When we follow Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sin and put our faith and trust in him, we are given at least one spiritual gift at that moment. Now, it mentions here at the bottom of here in chapter, verse 11, he says, as the Holy Spirit wills. So it's the Spirit of God that sovereignly gives us what God wants us to have. But every true believer has at least one spiritual gift. But I will say this to make it very clear. God cannot do anything for us until he has made us righteous. So if we're talking here about spiritual gifts and you've never committed your life in a complete way to Jesus Christ, if you've never laid it all on the line and repented of your sins and trusted him, that's the first thing that needs to happen in your life. Because we can go through these gifts and you could say, oh, that sounds good. But without the Holy Spirit indwelling you, none of these will ever happen in a true and a real sense. So that God is calling us to be born again. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What this means is that grace is free, but it only comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus alone is the doorway into heaven. He, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so if we want to receive any gifting or any grace from God, we must humble ourselves. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. He gives it to us as we humble ourselves before him. So that is the first step if we want to know and experience. We're going to talk about how to discern spiritual gifts in our own lives. But the first thing we must do is come to Christ by his grace. And when we are born again, when we are changed and made new by the grace of God, God gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. This means that this is an initial deposit to our future inheritance. But what a deposit the Holy Spirit is. Now I also will say that even every, as every believer in Jesus Christ has at least one gift, potentially more, no individual Christian has all of the gifts. Not any one Christian has all of them. Why? Well, this concept of diversity within unity. This is why we need the body of Christ. This is why we need to gather together when we fellowship and, and join together in small groups and come together and worship because we all bring spiritual gifts to the table. Now, some of us need to stir and cultivate those gifts to recognize them and to be able to develop them according to the faith that God gives. But we need one another, and we need to be drawn to, to Christ in our fellowship with one another, and we need diversity. And this is what Paul's making very clear in his letter to the Corinthians. And it is possible, I will also add, that we can receive more spiritual gifts in our spiritual journey as God, as we seek the Lord and as we ask of the Lord. God does, at times, give us more spiritual gifts. And I'll talk more about that particular subject in the weeks ahead. But every true Christian has at least one gift. And these spiritual gifts he mentions here are given for the common good. In other words, Paul's saying that spiritual gifts are meant to build up the church. They're meant to build up the kingdom of God. They're not intended to divide or to tear down. Now, the one thing they will tear down is our pride. <laughs> but as far as tearing down the, the body of Christ, and one thing I've learned is that the gifts of the Holy Spirit must be matched with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if we want to discern whether or not something is really of the Holy Spirit or someone is of the Holy Spirit, we need to look at the fruit that is being manifested at that particular moment. Now, the way of saying it, according to Galatians, does that spiritual gift produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? If, if we see God working and in, in the Holy Spirit moving, he will produce that fruit within an individual life or within a body of a church. But if that person or that ministry produces conflict, tension, anger, frustration, bitterness, or confusion, it is most likely not the Holy Spirit. Now, I will say there are times where the Holy Spirit does things that blows our minds, and we can't simply judge things from the flesh of perceiving things. 
But one of the best ways to test or discern various ministry or people is look at the fruit that is being manifested. Is it causing confusion or is it causing peace and grace and comfort? That is a very key to understanding the Spirit of God and His activity. And so the gifts of the Spirit are given for the common good, for the building up, for the edification of the church. And so therefore, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not toys They are tools. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not toys, something to play with. They're tools to be used under the lordship of Jesus Christ for the building of God's kingdom according to the will of God. So what, what we're talking about here when we're talking about spiritual gifts is not just focusing on the gifts of themselves, but how to be led of the Holy Spirit. How to be led of the Spirit of God so that He will... We will become kind of the conduit, as it were, where God's spirit and grace can flow in us and through us. And we're going to talk, Lord willing, in the days and weeks ahead about this. But Paul here in verses verses 8 and following, he offers a sizable list of these nine gifts which we're going to talk about specifically in the weeks ahead. I'm not sure if we're going to take one gift per Sunday or do several at a, a week. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit guide that time. But once again, these gifts listed here are representative of the spiritual gifts, not exhaustive. There are many other gifts that are listed, as we explained earlier. But throughout this series, what I would also like to do is take some time to expel various myths related to spiritual gifts. There are some people that believe that certain gifts do not uh, happen today. They call this cessationism. We're going to talk about why I personally believe that's a wrong perspective in seeing the spiritual gifts. But we want to address things biblically. But once again, there's a lot of abuse and false teaching related to this subject of spiritual gifts. So I want to just kind of, as God wills and God gives grace provide some explanation, and put aside various myths that maybe some of us have accepted and adopted in our, in our thinking. And when we affirm spiritual gifts, I also want to make this very clear. When we welcome spiritual gifts, essentially we are welcoming God. Let me say that again. When we affirm the gifts, essentially we are welcoming God. So who wouldn't want God's work and activity? A.B. Simpson said, It is one thing to be baptized into the body, it is another thing to drink of the ocean into which we have been plunged. Every ministry, in order to be effectual, must be inspired and made efficient by the Holy Ghost. And he is absolutely right. Friends, I can get up here and, and preach and turn blue in the face and shout and, and make a lot of noise and all these, but unless the Spirit of God touches your life and anoints my lips, nothing is ever going to be accomplished. We are so inadequate in ourselves. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God to to draw us, to guide us, to fill us, and to use us. And if we're ever coming into a new year in 2021, I think it's especially during these times that we need to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. Amen? We need to be filled with Jesus. In His Spirit, especially when we see darkness surrounding us, especially when we see what is going on in the chaos in our culture and the political divides and the spiritual darkness that is destroying many lives around us, we need the Spirit of Jesus to empower us, to be filled with faith and hope and love and all that God has for us. Paul says we need to be discerning. And when we affirm the gifts We are essentially welcoming God. And my desire here at Clay House is that we would welcome a greater outpouring and a greater fullness of the Holy Spirit in our midst, that we would exalt Jesus and everything done to the glory of Him. I'm not sure what your background is or your experience may be. I'm sure all of us have varied experiences. Uh, Some of us, maybe when we talk about this kind of matter and spiritual gifts, some of us are like, yes, I'm completely on board. Let's saddle up and go. We should have talked about this years ago. And let's, you know, we're ready and we're ready. We're just a horse at the gate ready for everything to open up. Others of us, maybe because of past experiences or maybe because we've witnessed abuse in the church, maybe we have a natural bent towards skepticism or we don't want to 
have a circus happen. And we are a bit more cautious. I understand. And I too don't want a circus. But I only want what God wants. But could it be that the devil has worked overtime to make us afraid of the very one who draws us close to Jesus? The Holy Spirit. And as your pastor, I'm simply advocating for us to welcome Jesus more fully in our midst. Jesus, would you come? Would you break strongholds? Would you set us free? Would you heal? Would you deliver? Would you save? Would you mend broken relationships? Would you do the things you need to do both in us and through us? I want Jesus, friends. And I hope that's your prayer too. And the truth is, no matter what our backgrounds may be, none of us have experienced the heights or the depths or the breadth of who God is. And really, all eternity when we get to heaven, if for those of us who are in Christ, will be a continuing revelation of who God is and what He has done in our lives. You know, there's a story years ago of a, a, a young boy that, that picked up a, a, a cup of, of water in the, in the ocean, and he was looking at the water and saying, boy, that's, that's, that's a decent-sized cup, when he what, didn't he see the full ocean in front of him. And like that little boy, some of us are so proud of the, the cup that we have. Why, well, I know this, and I've experienced this. But could it be that God wants us to see the whole ocean? The fullness of his glory and goodness and what he desires to do in our lives. We get so focused on this when God says, I want to take you to deeper waters. I want to take you and plunge you into the depths of my spirit and my grace so that you can be a witness for me. How many with lifted hands would say with a childlike faith, God, I want all that you have for me in my life. Amen? We all do. Could it be that 2021 is a year that God is inviting us to a place of deeper waters, to a place of greater fullness, to a place in our lives where we begin and continue in the gifts of the Spirit as He gives us, and maybe God will pour out new gifts this year in your life or in mine. My prayer as we go through these mini-series on spiritual gifts over the next number of weeks is that God would do three things. First of all, that he would bring some of us to true faith in Jesus and that he would bestow upon you the gift of the Holy Spirit, first of all. The second thing my prayer has been as we go into this series is that God would stir the gifts that he's already placed within you. Some of us have buried our gifts and not put them into use and yet we have the nerve to ask God for more when we're not even being faithful with what he's given. That God would stir the gifts within us. And thirdly, that he would increase our faith and pour out new gifts to the glory of Jesus.